after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he spent some time there with them and baptized. John was also baptizing at Anean near Salim, because water was abundant there, and people kept coming and were being baptized. John, of course, had not yet been thrown into prison. Now a discussion about purification arose between John's disciples and a Jew. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you testified, here he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, No one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason my joy has been fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, yet no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted his testimony has certified this, that God is true. He whom God sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has placed all things in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will not see life, but must endure God's wrath. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the third Sunday in a sermon series called Blessed Insurance. The first week was Get a Piece of the Rock. Last week was like a good neighbor this week is you're in good hands this is the oldest of the slogans about life insurance it was thought of in 1950 so 70 years companies often have slogans but very few of them last that long this one has made it into the advertising hall of fame you're in good hands it started back in 1950 when an executive from Allstate, which was a fairly new insurance agency at the time, or a corporation, it started not there, but because one of the executive's child, uh, his child was in the hospital, facing a very difficult surgery. And when he got the word, his wife said to him, don't worry, he is in good hands, talking about the doctor. And so, when he went to the meeting and they were looking for a slogan for an insurance company, what better slogan than you're in good hands? Because what does it mean to be in good hands? It means that you are in the, in the care and under the supervision of someone who is competent, someone who is sure, someone who is trustworthy. And so, as we begin to look at this in terms of sermons, this morning, did you notice there are a lot of hands in the scripture we read this morning? The hands and the everlasting arms because we are in good hands. Not for 70 years, not for 700 years, but for all of eternity, we are in the hands of Jesus Christ. Now, I love the passages that we read because I picked them for one thing. Of course, it's one of the benefits of being in this role, is sometimes I go off the lectionary you got to understand, I've been through the lectionary over 12 times now, and there are so many passages of scripture that need to be read that don't get included, and I think these are two of those, particularly the one from Isaiah. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his suffering ones. But what did Zion say, and I love how Mark added in some of us today, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. That and how long, O oh Lord, seem to be the rally cries of the pandemic era in which we live. How long will we be worshiping in the parking lot? How long will we be afraid to have conversations or dinners with each other outside of being outside with masks on? But Isaiah is talking here in the words of the servant. The servant who appears throughout Isaiah's testimony. And this comes from chapter 49, which comes after the second section of Isaiah begins. Because like all good prophets, Isaiah is given the job to warn the people that their faithlessness is getting them into a heap a lot of trouble, which meant the Babylonian exile. The people were carried out of the promised land. 
They were forced into slavery. They were forced to live in a place without their temple, without their holy city of Jerusalem. But like any good prophet, once you've told people what's going to happen to them, you start to preach redemption. And Isaiah begins in chapter 40 with those familiar words that we hear so often at funerals. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says the Lord your God. Tell them that the time of their transgressions have passed. And here we have a word of comfort, but the people aren't too sure. But what does God say to them here? Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? God's love for us is as strong as the love a mother has for her child, something that every culture and every time on the planet can recognize, the love a mother has for her child, and being promised that God will not forget us ever. God sees the walls of the city that have been destroyed, and they will be rebuilt. And the most wonderful part in this for me is, see, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. How many of you have ever written something on the palm of your hand so you didn't forget it? How many of you have ever written that in a Sharpie so you certainly wouldn't forget it? Or sweat it off before you got home? we got some people out here who have done that. To be inscribed on the palm of a hand is to have something that is there permanently. Something that shows who you are and what you are thinking of because it is so important to you that you have it where you see it all the time. Kind of like a tattoo. It's a little strange because in Jewish teaching you can't have a tattoo even to this day and be buried in a Jewish cemetery if you're tattooed. Well, I'm not going to ask you all to confess or to show your tattoos, but one in four Americans now has a tattoo. One in four. I don't have one because I am too old. I am from the generation where the people who had tattoos were in the Marines or in the Navy and it said mom on the shoulder with a heart. And when I've had girls tell me in churches and my youth groups that they want a tattoo, I will say to them, let me be a cautionary tale. Because the little rosebud that you might have somewhere on the top part of your body may be in full bloom and much lower later on. Because a tattoo is permanent, isn't it? Now, one in four Americans has a tattoo. If you're talking about the millennial generation, it's between one out of every two and three millennial people have tattoos. It is the thing to do now to get inked. And the problem with a tattoo is that it is permanent. So while tattoos are on the rise, what else is on the rise? The laser removal of a tattoo. You can spend all kinds of money getting a laser tattoo removal done usually in a doctor's office, but now they are beginning to sell home tattoo removal kits which I would say, please don't try this at home. But why do people want to have a tattoo removed? They've surveyed people and the answer is always the same. Because the idea of having Justin Bieber forever on your shoulder is maybe something that when you get to be about 30 or 40, you want to rethink. Or we've even had some famous folks who had their spouse du jour's name tattooed on their shoulder or somewhere else. And at the end of the marriage, they want the tattoo removed. That's why you have to be careful about what you have done permanently. But you don't have to be careful about understanding God's permanent love for us in Jesus Christ. This is what we're talking about in John's Gospel as well. People are going to John and saying, there's this other guy baptizing. We're not sure that it was Jesus or his disciples who were baptizing at that time. But they're confused because they had been following John, and John is very clear on who he is there to be the forerunner of. John says, I am not the Messiah. This is the Messiah. He points to the one who is to come, and he says what we know to be true. God has put all things where? Into his hands. God has put everything into the control, into the care, into the love, into the mercy, into the capable hands of Jesus, who is God incarnate with us. I hope you feel safe in the hands of God. I love the story that Elaine told about the woman with cancer who was out doing her meditation on finding a way to deal with cancer, and she felt someone come alongside her and take her hand. I believe that that was Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
because look at all that he did. He was the God with hands. I love the story that I've heard so many times about a young boy who was scared during a thunderstorm. And he kept getting up and he kept going to his parents' room and saying, can I get in bed with you? Can I get in bed with you? And his dad was saying, go back to your own bed. God is with you. God is with you. God is with you. And about the 15th time he came and his father said, God is with you, he said, I know God is with me, but I need a God with skin right now. And the father took him in to the bed with mom and dad and put him between them where he felt safe. Because sometimes we do need to feel the presence in a very real way. One of the hardest parts of this pandemic has been for us the inability to shake hands or to hug. We all come up to each other when we were so excited to see each other after all the months we had been apart. And we're here on the parking lot and you're so close and we go virtual hugs and air kisses. Virtual high five, virtual passing of the peace. We learn for the day when we can actually touch one another again. But until those times come, we can rest assured that we are in God's hands and there are no safer places to be in this world than in God's hands. We are inscribed in God's hand. God will not forget, forget us. God will not forsake us. God will forgive us. God will give us new life in Jesus Christ. Now, the insurance company, I don't want to say the name, but the one you know that says you're in good hands with them, they were sued quite a few years ago now on the basis of their slogan, you're in good hands, because someone who had invested with them, not in their life insurance division, but in their financial division, had invested her life savings. She was married to a man with Alzheimer's, who had early onset Alzheimer's, while also caring for a grown child with developmental disabilities who needed to move into a group home. And as her entire life savings were depleted, she sued on the basis of what happened to the good hands. Well, the judge ruled that the good of the client does not outweigh the good of the company. And if it's a choice between the good of the client and the good of the company, the company is the one that will thrive. And the person, even though the slogan says you're in good hands, she felt that she had slipped through those good fingers that she had been promised. But the promise of God is not like that. It's not a slogan. It's the word of God for the people of God. We are in good hands. Our times are in God's hands. We have a Savior who stretched his arms upon a cross so that we might know life and life eternal through him. And we're at a time when we have to remember those stories of our faith that remind us that Christ who died is also Christ who is raised, is also Christ who who has promised to come again. I know we're all getting tired of worshiping remotely. I know we're getting tired of being cut off from those we love. I know we're still scared. I know that we aren't sure when this is ever going to end. But this will end. This crisis will end. And we will be together again. And until that time, we will be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ remotely for each other. We will be the ones who reach out with love and concern to the world because we just need to remember where we are. We are in the hands of God and there is no safer place. So until the day comes when we gather together again, hold fast to the promises of God in Jesus Christ. Know that you are in his hands, that we are in his hands together, and that there we will find safety because his word is eternal, his word is sure, because he has inscribed us, he has tattooed us on his hand and we'll never want that to be removed. To the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, amen.